My name is Mike Nielsen. I'm the British Museum's replication specialist. I'm the guy that makes all the copies for the exhibitions, public galleries, academic study, you name it, I do it. Anything from a small coin to a colossal statue, or in this case, a bronze gladiator helmet. I've made various um, helmets for other museums, but they've always been produced from moulds. Either using the electroforming process, where you plate into a mould to um, produce the perfect copy, then that copy is then hand painted to match the original. But the request was for a reconstruction, which is a bit different from a facsimile or a cast, which actually represents the object as it is now but a reconstruction represents the object, how it would have looked when it was originally made. In this case, the original is so degraded and has been purposely damaged in its history. So uh, I've had to go about raising the object um, from flat sheet of bronze, just like the original would have been done at some point. It was found in the fields of a village called Hawkden. It's first century AD. There is a very important part of the whole object, apart from the, the shape of the object, these holes are very, very important because they line up with the holes from similar objects, gladiator helmets, found in Pompeii. They have the same design the same holes have been punched through the bronze to attach the visor part of the helmet. From these holes, we could predict that there used to be a visor with its own eye holes, which were honeycombed themselves. It would come down like that, and there'd be various plates. Pretty bad drawing, but this is how it would have looked. But of course, these areas have been missing and there is one remaining rivet, item number one, in my detective work, which proves that there has been a visor riveted to the bowl of a helmet. With objects like this, there's always an open question of exactly how these things were made. I can study the object and come up with um, theories, such as how did they drill these holes, the fact is that they didn't drill them, they just punched punched the holes through with a probably an iron lodge punch, which has pierced the metal and has pushed the metal through and then actually you can see on the inside how the metal splays out and then they just cut the sharpness off, the rough ends off it, which then indicates that there has to be some sort of lining, otherwise these um, sharp bits would be going through damaging your head every time somebody hits the helmet. If we are to look at the edges, you can see that the edges have a sort of pattern like that, a zigzag edge. And that's been produced by somebody just chiseling the metal out because they wouldn't have had the power tools which we have today, like a jigsaw or, or some sort of cutter, they needed to cut it bit by bit. Cut here, cut there, cut here, cut there. A scissor sort of action, really, which produces this edge, which is actually hidden by the trim, which is evidence number two in my little detective work. So this just masks off the roughness of the, of the object smartens the whole things up. So you wouldn't want to hurt a gladiator, would you really? You can see I have a wooden mallet here. This is for ironing out the heavy blows or dimples which are formed in the metal when I use this raising hammer. This sort of irons out the deep blows and makes it a bit smoother. Various hammers move the metal in various directions. A round hammer, push the metal, 
in every direction. That's a hammer, which has got a domed top to it, like that. Hammer, which has got a flat top, like that. Pushes the metal in two directions only, that way and that way. And what you don't want with a raising hammer is any sharp edges because that will cut into the metal. So raising hammers tend to have a smoother appearance. You can steer the metal um, with a raising hammer and you've got more control than you have with a round hammer. But the initial stages, you just want to create a bowl. And this is the object you use for that. So it's important to say at this point that we actually purchased this sheet, this nice, flat, uniform sheet from the manufacturers. But in the first century AD, they probably hammered their own sheet from an ingot. They would have started from real basic material. We're lucky today that we can get such um, pristine material and it's all at our fingertips. As you can see, it's very, very physical work. It's not only physical work, it's very, very noisy work. The whole process is called dishing. Just getting some movement in that metal before it's annealed. What you're seeing here, this dartboard pattern, is to help me keep track of the um, circumference of the object as I'm beating the metal. You have to stay within the uh, parameters of this dartboard if you're going to keep some symmetry. This gas torch is just using natural gas and air and it is uh, heating the bronze sheet up. The original makers probably worked um, this metal, uh, heating the metal on a furnace, um, on hot coals with bellows to, to get up the heat, to get the oxygen within the flames to reach that temperature to anneal the uh, metal. So you heat it up to about a cherry red colour which is then instantly quenched. And that whole process is called annealing, which softens the structure of the metal itself and relaxes the metal, which has become very work hard. You can then apply it, the metal to the stake and with the raising hammer, do a further round of raising. What you require this early stage is you have to hype. You're not actually um, trying to achieve the shape of the helmet, you just need that height before you broaden it out. What you can see here is that I've raised the metal up to form the shape of the original. It's quite unusual that the original has quite a large flange of metal which runs horizontally. Usually with um, provocateur helmets, to use this correct term, is you have something like that. And this neck guard, they tend to run much more of an angle, steeper angle, a bit like Darth Vader really. This angle created a lot of problems and it was very difficult to make the metal comply to the image of the original. The metal wants to take its own direction and to try to make it comply to your needs is, is a bit of a skill in itself. So this is the brow bar. The brow bar itself is broken dead center and you can actually see a number of hits which has been delivered to the object in order to break it in two. This missing area here indicates that there's been a protrusion which has snapped during the process of purposely damaging the object. Again, it's a case of joining the dots up, doing a bit of detective work, being a bit practically minded. Something would need to retain the position of this brow bar on the helmet itself because the rivets wouldn't be able to fix that position. It would tend to want to move up, especially if somebody is applying blows during the games. This thing is just going to come down and scissors someone's nose off or something. So um, it needed to be fixed. When you work with metal, you get a feel of how things are made. This hasn't been raised, it's actually been cast in brass. 
because it's simply an awful lot of work for someone to do to hammer out and to cut such a strong metal as brass. It's far easier to make a prototype and then cast it in uh, molten metal. It saves a lot of time. So this is me warming up some modelling clay to make the uh, prototype, which is going to be then sent to a foundry. This shape has got to be turned into metal. The original makers would have used the wax to recreate their prototype. And here's the silicon mould. Once the silicon is set, the mould can then be peeled away from the model. And now you've got the negative shape from the positive model complete with that little metal sprue, which I believe was part of the original design. So here we have Damon from the crucible foundry, who is melting some pieces of bronze in a crucible, ready to pour into a mould they've made from my silicon mould. And there you go. Once the metal has cooled down, you then break away the investment material, which is like a ceramic type shell. Don't you just love these old techniques? No airs and grace, no technology, just pure skill. And there you see, he has the metal version of my plasticine prototype. This would have been a funnel in the mould where metal is poured through that funnel. And all that's happened is that all this area here is filled up with molten metal and topped up to the top of the funnel. This is a sprue. As the uh, metal cools, it will want to move inward and distort this perfect shape. So this is just really a sprue which keeps the two terminals apart and these are excess materials which will indicate um, the holes where the holes are required and also help vent out gases in the mould um, as the metal is poured. As I was saying, the eye guards and face guards are actually missing. This is how I went about making them. Just going online and comparing our helmet with gladiator helmets of the period, I was able to design these and make these eye guards using the jigsaw and the jeweler saw and the needle files in order to achieve the copies. The original would have been hand cut using very similar techniques to what I'm using here, apart from the jigsaw. If they had files, they would have been able to cut the holes using a punch and files. An awful lot of work for someone. But it was slave labour, you have to remember. I suspect that the helmet wasn't made by one person. It would have been a team of craftsmen, all specialised within certain aspects of the helmet. So what I'm doing here is using the modelling clay to make a prototype to conform with the contours of this leading edge here. You would have thought that you could simply apply the trim by bending over a strip of metal with a pair of pliers and then just attaching it to this leading edge here. Wouldn't that be good? Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that because the metal band won't conform to that no matter how much coaxing you do with a pair of pliers. This is how I worked out how they actually created that curve. It was a bit of a eureka moment actually. This is just a block of wood basically with a V-shaped cut into it. This V here enables me to place the semi-folded strip and then the downward blow then forces the sides of the strip slightly upwards because you're stretching this centerpiece here with the chisel that forms this sort of um, shape it was a big surprise to me that they must have been using a similar technique to this in the first century
rivets were extensively used in, in the creation of the helmet. It was the technique to attach one piece to another and probably the only technique they had at the time. The main point again here is that everything looks a bit rough and that is exactly how the original would have looked. Nothing was machined, everything had a rough edge to it. Each rivet was hand cut and there was over 10 rivets to be made. They don't take very long to make. You make a rivet by simply rolling over the top of a bar of bronze or brass and then doing the necessary cuts. Before I ventured on raising the helmet from the flat sheet, I did realise it was going to be required to be tinned, but unfortunately the traditional techniques of tinning are a bit of a dying art. They tend to use a lot of electroplating tinning where an item is placed into a vat of solution and an electric current is passed over and, and tin is plated onto that object and is plated very uniformly. Whereas the traditional techniques, there are always little ambiguities and spots where it hasn't quite taken. And I wanted that hand finished technique. So I decided on attempting to tin it myself. It was a bit risky in a, in a sense because there's a lot of work invested in getting the helmet this far, but you just have to um, apply yourself and have a go really. So what I'm doing here is applying a flux to the surface of the helmet itself. Now I'm applying the heat which melts the tin, which is like a tin solder. And the flux enables the tin to be moved around the surface. You've got to work very quickly and you've got to retain the heat. And you've got to be very careful about remelting areas you've already worked. And here I'm washing away the remnants of solder. It hasn't been polished at this stage, but already it looks very silvery. Well, if you're expecting me to jump up for joy and skip around the room, as the maker, I'm so self-critical and I just see my mistakes. What gives me great pleasure is that I know that this item is going to form a tool for education really. It's going to perhaps inspire children to go down the same path as I have went. And also gives an insight to how the original would have appeared. So I see this as an educational tool really.